Hey everybody, welcome. This is Andrew David Schiller. We're going to learn today a bit about neuropathy and we're going to talk about it in the context of one of my patients. Her name was Barbara. She's 57 years old. She had severe, severe burning pain in her legs and her feet that was really becoming problematic for her. Uh, the pain began sometime after she got chemotherapy for treatment of ovarian cancer, which was about four years prior to seeing me. Now, thank God the cancer was gone. There was no recurrence in all this time, but she was left with a lot of pain in her feet. She had aching and pain in her joints. Her muscles were achy. Uh, she was feeling tired and fatigued all the time, and a doctor gave her a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. She's not able to sleep at night, feeling exhausted all the time, brains foggy a lot of the time. And she's getting less and less functional as time was going by, and she was obviously anxious and scared about that because She's a fairly young woman and wondering, well, what's my life going to be like that as time goes by? So she saw a doctor, a neurologist, who did a nerve conduction and EMG. Now that's a study that just says, well, the nerves work or don't work at certain thresholds. And so her EMG was positive. She had peripheral neuropathy, which means that the nerves weren't conducting impulses like they should. And as is usually the case when someone gets conventional treatment for neuropathy, she got treated with a few medications, Lyrica and Elevil or Amitriptyline. And these are kind of first line agents for neuro neuropathic pain. And they sometimes help with the pain, but they often cause bad side effects. And that was the case for Barbara. She got a little bit of relief from her pain, but she was dizzy and fuzzier than she was before. And she couldn't think and felt like a zombie a lot of the time. So. You know, she continued to take the uh, Neurontin because nothing else was helping her, but she would only take it at night, and it was helping her a bit to maybe sleep a bit better, but she was still tired and fuzzy during the day, even though she took it at a night, and she wasn't able to take it during the day because of the side effects. So we're going to jump off from here and talk a bit about neuropathy, and then talk about the specifics about what we did for Barbara and like how she got better, because she did. Of course she did. That's what I'm talking about her. But we're going to try to focus on a few points. So what is neuropathy and how it's related to chemotherapy and what other things cause it? Um, how does conventional deal with neuropathy, conventional medicine deal with neuropathy and why isn't it very good at addressing it? Um, and what did we do to do with Barbara and why did it help her? And then we'll talk more broadly about functional medicine and how that has relevance and importance in treating neuropathy. So first of all, what's neuropathy? It's pretty simply neuro, neuro nerves pathy sickness neuropathy is when the nerves get sick and the two main categories are like compression neuropathy you know you've heard of a a disc that gets herniated and presses on a nerve that's a kind of neuropathy and sometimes people get pressure on a nerve elsewhere and those are neuropathies but they're compression neuropathies her case was what we call systemic neuropathy or well that's the best way to call it is systemic neuropathy and that means all the nerves are being affected um, so let's talk about what nerves are. Um, nerves are not like electrical wires at all. They do conduct electrochemical signals, but they're like living cells. They have a cell body that's like a power plant and a chemical manufacturing facility. And then they got these long tubules called axons that help them communicate their signals elsewhere. And they have other tubes that come into them called dendrites that let them receive information. Um, the point is that the conduction of nerves and function of nerves depend on what's going on in that cell body and how it produces the things that the nerves need to function. It, the, the, the cell body and the nucleus pr 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 produce um, proteins and ion channels and fats and very diff various different things that maintain the health and function of that nerve so it can be vital and functional. Uh, it's important to notice that um, when neuropathy happens, all the nerves get sick, but the longest nerves tend to be the ones that get affected most because they got the greatest territory to address. So whereas the cell body is producing all this stuff and it gets transported down the nerve to help the nerve function to heal and repair the nerve as life goes on, with long nerves, that process doesn't make it to the end of the nerve when the nerves get sick. So that's why when people have neuropathy, it tends to start in the toes or and the feet and legs. Sometimes it involves the hands. You don't usually get peripheral neuropathy first affecting the back or the arms. It's, there are some kinds, but usually it affects the longer nerves and thus, thus the feet and then the hands. Um, 
So yeah, we talked about nerves have to produce proteins and enzymes and ion channels. They produce energy. And when these things don't happen and the nerve gets sick and it stops functioning, for some people that means they're numb. For some people that means they've got burning, fiery pain. For some people they get shocking electrical sen uh, sensations. Some people are numb and it's burning. It's a weird sensation like, I can't feel it but it hurts. For some people they get sickness in the nerves that control their muscles, not just the sensation. So they might have muscle weakness or muscle cramps or spasms or twitching of their muscles which can be very disturbing or loss of coordination. There's many things that can cause neuropathy. Diabetes is probably the most common cause. Uh, there are also toxic effects of chemotherapy like we talked about. The chemotherapy makes the nerves sick. We're going to talk a bit more about that in a bit because it's, it's new knowledge basically. Uh, neuropathy can also come from systemic metabolic things like thyroid abnormalities or autoimmune disorders like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or other things that create immunity where the body attacks itself. Other causes include nutritional problems like B12, vitamin B12 or folate deficiency. Also heavy medical, metal toxi, toxicity can cause neuropathy and other environmental toxins can do it. The list is pretty long. Uh, the trouble is that it's hard to figure out what the cause is in many cases. Studies have shown that something like 60% or 65% of people with getting chemotherapy actually get peripheral neuropathy. For a lot of them, it gets better when the chemotherapy stops, but many of them, something like 30%, seem to still have neuropathy six months later, so they have enduring pain, burning, weakness, various combinations of symptoms like Barbara described, so it can really cause a lot of suffering and debility for life for a person unless it gets treated properly. So what do we do about neuropathy? Let's talk about the conventional medicine point of view and the unfortunate answer is we don't do much. Um, obviously a good neurologist will look for underlying diseases or nutritional deficiencies that can be treated. For instance, somebody whose thyroid is off, they can treat the thyroid. Someone who has B12 deficiency or folate deficiency, that can be treated and first, frequently the person will actually get better, the neuropathy will go away and I've seen that many times. But still many people have no identified cause. So in that case, you know, we give medications or drugs that are basically masking or controlling the pain. The first line agents now are what we call anti-epileptic medications like Lyrica and Neurontin that reduce irritability of nerves. Uh, they also give tricyclic antidepressants like Elevil, Nortriptyline, a few other classes like that. Um, they don't address the underlying cause. They're frequently a band-aid for the pain. They do help a lot of people. The problem is that neuropathy can progress if the underlying cause isn't treated, and then the pain gets worse and the medicine stops working, or you can increase the dose of medicine, but then it starts to cause side effects, and the side effects are usually cognitive side effects because we're talking about medications that reduce nerve irritability, which means your brain doesn't function as well when you're on these drugs. So what about supplements and nutrients for neuropathy? So it's a no-brainer like, okay, your B12 is low, treat it, um, or your folate, or other things like that. Um, <clears throat> but it's also important to know that if you have a normal B12 and you have neuropathy, it might be that your B12 is not normal for you. Uh, the low normal range of B12 is sometimes not enough for some people, and they need more B12. There is another blood test that's called the methylmalonic acid that looks not just at the blood level of B12, but how it's functioning, how its metabolic effects are working. And so that MMA or methylmalonic acid can sort of distinguish a low B12 that's actually functional from one that's not functional and needs treatment. My view is, look, B12 is cheap. Whether you take it orally or by shot, you supplement it and get the level up to the middle of the range anyhow and there's very little toxicity with that sort of approach and so the risk benefit of just doing it is often better than fighting with the insurance company to get an extra blood test. Um, yeah, so next thing is about studying nutrients in general and this is pro part of the challenge of conventional medicine and chronic things with neuropathy. So um, nutraceutical research has a general problem and it's true for neuropathy as well and the problem is that much research is done on single nutrients, and it's kind of like the nutrients a is a medication. And that's not the way nutrients work in reality. 
um, our metabolic processes are complex. There's lots of different factors that are involved. And frequently, when somebody has things that are like depleting nutrients or causing physiologic changes, we'll talk about this in a bit, when the physiologic changes that seem to cause neuropathy are going on, there's a number of different uh, biochemical pathways that can get disturbed. And so we go in and we treat with one nutrient. It's not really getting at the complexity of the problem. Part of this has to do with what I see as a bit of a rut that modern medicine is stuck in. And it's for good reason, like most things, because um, back in the day, we developed this idea that one disease has one cause and needs one treatment. And you can understand the, how that would come out of the antibiotic era, because there was a point in time where a person who got pneumonia would usually die. And until they discovered that, you know what, streptococcus causes pneumonia and penicillin kills streptococcus. So when someone has pneumonia, let's treat them with penicillin. And that, after that, most people with pneumonia live. So it made a huge impact on medical thinking. And we all got ingrained with Cox postulates, which say one disease, one cause, one treatment. So when we do studies of nutrients, we want to look at one treatment. Well, does this one work? Does that one work? As opposed to, let's use a constellation of nutrients that we know are involved in nerve health, which is much more the functional medicine approach, which seems to work in a lot of my patients. So that's what I tend to lean towards. Um, look, if there's a randomized controlled trial showing that a particular nutrient is helpful, that's the first thing to use, because that's a certain kind of truth. But if there's not a randomized controlled trial, showing that there's evidence of effect, efficacy of a given nutrient or approach that's not evidence of inefficacy. So because we don't have trials doesn't mean it doesn't work. Or even if we did trials and they weren't effective, it might mean that the trials weren't done properly. And so a lot of doctors seem to think that absence of evidence is evidence of absence, if you know what I mean. Um, so let's not think that way. Let's think cost, benefit, benefit, risk analysis. and. The risk of adding some nutrients usually means it costs a little bit of money because they're not covered by insurance. Most of them are pretty safe, um, so it's different than doing brain surgery or giving really powerful drugs that potentially damage the body systems. And I think we have a little more leeway to try things that make sense mechanistically from a risk-benefit analysis. So regarding neuropathy. Sticking back in, in conventional medicine, one, one bit of light is that there have been some studies in something called alpha-lipoic acid. Alpha-lipoic acid is an antioxidant and nutrient that helps the mitochondria, which are the cellular energy production plants that we'll talk about in a bit. And it's been shown, uh, alpha-lipoic acid has been shown to help pain and actually help the, the, the process of diabetic neuropathy. So sometimes that get used, get, gets used by conventional doctors. Sometimes it's even on formularies and it gets used for neuropathies besides diabetes. And it makes a whole lot of sense to start with that, and potentially combine it. So conventional medicine doesn't have that much offer to, to offer to treat the neuropathy if we can't find the cause. And we often can't find the cause. Um, we've got medications that can cover up the symptoms, but that doesn't get at the cause, so it sometimes gets worse. But if we're willing to think out of the box, and I like to think out of the box because it helps, uh, there are things we can do that could be helpful for neuropathy. So let's talk about that. Let's start talking about the cutting edge understanding of what causes neuropathy. We're not going to go too into the science, but the basics are like this. And they didn't teach this to me in medical school, and they probably still don't teach it in medical school. It's in the mainstream journals. It is the cutting edge of understanding of neuropathy. All the science isn't in. Things aren't completely conclusive, but this is the trend. And what we're seeing is that many cases of neuropathy have at their root a vicious cycle between low-grade sterile inflammation, oxidative stress, and mitochondrial dysfunction. Three parts to this vicious cycle. So what are those three things? What are we talking about? Inflammation means that the immune system is activated. We're not talking about a red hot, warm, tender knee joint or an infected thing on your skin. We're talking about low grade activation of the immune system that doesn't have to have a bacteria or a virus causing it. Um, low grade activation of the, of the immune system, also called sterile inflammation, seems to be the root of a lot of chronic illnesses and that's what mainstream science is showing us. Uh, but we still don't really know what to do with it in mainstream medicine. In functional medicine, we treat it. So let's talk about that. There's inflammation. So 
Along with inflammation, we get this thing called oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is the biochemical stress of living, basically. When my body digests food, it, it oxidizes food. It creates oxidation. My, has system, my body has systems to clean up oxidation. When I have immune responses and pro-inflammatory chemicals in my blood, it also, ta also taxes the the, the system that cleans up oxidation. Oxidative stress is like biochemical stress on the body, to put it simply. It's a lot more complicated than that, but that's a good way to think about it. So inflammation, oxidative stress, they go together, they cause each other, it's a bit of a vicious cycle. The third part is mitochondria, which are these cellular energy plants that live in all of our cells, and they produce the energy that our cells need to function. When the mitochondria don't work, our cells don't work. If the mitochondria and my nerves don't work, my nerves get sick. They stop producing all of the biochemical reaction they need to produce in order to function properly. So this combination of um, inflammation, oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction is a vicious three-way cycle. They all influence each other, and that seems to be part of what causes neuropathy. But here's the thing. It's not just causing neuropathy. This vicious cycle of inflammation, oxidative stress, and mitochondrial dysfunction is implicated in most of our most difficult chronic illnesses. Fibromyalgia for, for, for sure is one of them, and if you'll remember, this patient had fibromyalgia. So she had both things with one common cause. Wait a second, we're talking about the way most doctors think. One problem, one cause. We've got one patient with We've got one, a patient here that's got two different, so to speak, diagnoses, but they have an underlying root that's causing both of them. What I want to go in, this is a really important part, so really pay attention here. It's relevant for most people with chronic illness because this notion of like multiple diseases with one chronic set of physiologic imbalances is hugely important. And the problem is that if your doctor doesn't think about that, he's going to think of each disease as a separate problem with a separate cause with a separate drug to treat it. And so what happens with people with chronic illness is that they go through their life and they develop often based on common physiologic problems. They develop more and more symptoms that gets expressed into different areas and they pick up extra diagnoses and they pick up extra drugs and after a few years they've got five different or eight different or ten different diagnoses and five or eight different or ten different medications. Now this patient Barbara had neuropathy, fibromyalgia, anxiety, brain fog, insomnia, all of these can be connected to that same underlying physiology. So I see this again and again in my practice where people come in and they've got all these different diagnoses and we look into it and actually know there's some fundamental imbalances which are really the root of multiple diagnoses and the approach we take, which is functional medicine, <clears throat> actually frequently um, resolves or help heal, helps heal those underlying imbalances. Okay, so let's get back to Barbara. What did we do? So um, she was busy and she was getting ready to go on a big long trip. She didn't have time to start thinking about her diet and lifestyle and taking a bunch of supplements and doing a bunch of mind-body medicine, which is part of what we do in functional medicine. Um, we started something called LDN, and LDN is also called low-dose naltrexone. And what is that and why did I prescribe it? LDN is like a drug that's a non-drug. It's kind of hard to explain because it's made synthetically. but now, Trexone itself blocks the opioid system, and it blocks it so well that when we give a high dose, a heroin addict who takes naltrexone is less likely to abuse heroin because they can't get high from it because it blocks the heroin, it blocks the opioids. When we give really low dose naltrexone, what it does is temporarily, for just a few hours, blocks that opioid system, and then it goes away. But the body responds and says, whoa, I need more of my naturally occurring opioid system endorphins and enkephalins, these are the things that make us feel good and our body produces them in different degrees depending on us and our lifestyle and what we do. If you know people who run and they love it because they feel so good, it's because their endorphins and enkephalins are being pumped up. With LDN, when the, after the, the system gets blocked, the body produces more endorphins and it produces specifically enkephalin 15, I might be making that wrong, it could be enkephalin 5. Regardless, what metenkephalin does is it is also called opioid growth factor, and what it does is modulates the immune system. It reduces the expression of inflammatory immune chemicals called cytokines. This has been shown in a few different studies, so it reduces overactive immunity, which is pretty cool. 
um, especially for a problem that's being driven by inflammation, oxidative stress, and mitochondrial dysfunction, um, especially a painful situation where the body produces more of its natural pain blocking chemicals. So LDN kind of evokes the natural intelligence of the body and it doesn't stay around, it like, you know, goes out of the body after 10 or 12 hours. It doesn't have any real side effects usually. Sometimes it gets a person a little wired or maybe they can't sleep. Some people have a little bit more pain when they take it. You can't take it if you're taking opioids that are strong like tramadol or Percocet or, um, or morphine or fentanyl patch for pain. Um, but it does work a lot in terms of blocking pain and reducing overall inflammatory um, processes. That's part of why it seems to help with uh, illnesses that have a few, an immune ban uh, basis like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, a lot of chronic pain states like chronic regional pain syndrome, which used to get called RSD. These are inflammatory problems where the, the nerve cells that kind of control nerve function get activated and, and inflamed, and it seems to reduce that inflammation and activation and, and seems to help those problems in a lot of cases. So Barbara started LDN. We do it at a very low dose, and we gradually increase it over the course of two or three weeks, and then the person needs to take it for a while. She called me after about two weeks saying, Doc, what do I do? The burning pain is completely gone. I still have a lot of aching in my joints, um, but it's more tolerable somehow, and I'm sleeping a bit better. So is this it? What's happening? And the answer is, That's not it, no. Um, that's just the beginning, actually, because LDN is a process. LDN stimulates the body to stimulate itself to actually heal some of the underlying roots of an immune-mediated illness like um, neuropathy. So basically, the person needs a bit more time. I like to treat people for up to eight weeks before we say, okay, this is it, this is what we're getting. There's a lot of nuances to it. Some people need treatment that's longer. Some people get better faster. But the point is, she felt a lot better right off the bat and that's with LDN or low dose naltrexone. Um, what else do we wanna say about that? So she's gonna to continue to, treat, to take the LDN and hopefully I'll report back to you in a, few, uh, in a month or so and let you know what's going on. Let's talk about the bigger picture because I see LDN not usually as a standalone, although for some people it is because that's really what they want is give me something that's gonna fix me because I don't have the resources to take better care of myself. For people who are motivated to take care of themselves, who are motivated to get at the root of their illness, that's what functional medicine is about. Like we talked about, there's a vicious cycle of oxidative stress, inflammation, and impaired cellular energy production that underlies a lot of our chronic illnesses. Not just neuropathy, fibromyalgia, and chronic fatigue, but Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, diabetes, depression, anxiety, heart disease, autoimmune conditions like arthritis, colitis, lupus, multiple sclerosis, and so on. Really serious things have a root that generates the process over time and conventional treatment is typically based on blocking the end stage of that process with powerful medications. So if somebody comes to me and they're really sick and they're getting end stage organ damage, they need conventional treatment to stop that organ damage. But the wise thing is to try to get at the root. And that takes work. There's underlying, these underlying imbalances in, theology, in physiology have been shown to be Im improvable by things like dietary change, specific nutrients, uh, enhancing digestion and detoxification pathways that the body already has, mind-body therapies, and so on. The first part is, the first thing is to identify what's the particular issue in any given patient that's stimulating and activating the whole process. Uh, and then we try to make the lifestyle changes that bring the system back to health. So that process is called functional medicine. It's great if you're willing to actually listen and hear and be open and make lifestyle changes and choose to like take your life back in an active, proactive way. Uh, and there's potential, uh, tremendous benefits to that. So we'll be talking more about these things as time goes by and with more videos and more printed materials. That's it for today and I appreciate you watching. Um, if you don't mind, please like and share this post. Um, subscribe if you're seeing it on YouTube. Share it with your friends or anyone you think would benefit. Uh, get the word out. There are a lot of people who are suffering who don't know that there are options besides what conventional medicine gives them. Um, and there's level-headed ways to go into healing-oriented therapies in ways that are safe uh, so it makes sense. 
You can get on the free newsletter to receive news and updates about healing chronic illness and chronic pain through level added integration of conventional medicine and natural or healing oriented medicine. You can go to my website www.drschiller.com and click on the box in the upper right and get that newsletter. Um, thanks again for coming. I'm Andrew David Schiller. Take care. Be well.